Hello, tech friends, and thank you for tuning in to Emerging Technologies in Business, where we take a deep dive into different technologies that are impacting businesses today and in the very near future. I'm your host, Brock Reine, and this podcast is brought to you by Kincannon XR. Let's talk tech. Hello, everyone. Welcome back for another episode. Today, I have the pleasure of speaking with the founder and CEO of Channelnomics. Channelnomics is a business strategy and research firm focused on improving the performance and technology of companies' direct and indirect channels through their portfolio of market-leading products and services to accelerate and optimize routes to marketing utilization, Channelnomics' strategy, intelligence, and enablement services, Without further ado, I'd like to welcome award-winning journalist and avid blogger and podcaster, Larry Welsh. Larry, great to see you again. Thank you so much for being on the show today. How are you? I'm great, Brock. Thanks for having me. Well, Larry, first thing I want to uh, break into is, first and foremost, I want to clarify for our listeners what channel sales encompasses so that they have a basis of an understanding. I know most people have heard the term channel sales before, but for those that haven't, can you give our audience an idea of why channel sales are important to current businesses today? You know, I, this is one of those questions that you you just have to take a deep breath and say, okay, how would I explain this to my mother? Right. Uh, and and it's because most people don't understand uh, that they don't actually buy products from a company; they buy products from intermediaries. And the the example I give everybody uh, over the past couple of years is toilet paper. And why toilet paper is because during the pandemic we all kind of freaked out over it for some reason. Right. Because when it wasn't there on the shelves, we're like, going, oh, my God, what's happening? And that's when you realize that every product passes through multiple hands before it reaches you. And that's what indirect sales really are in what we call the channel. And we call it the channel because it's a way of focusing sales in specific directions through different models uh, to get to market in at scale. And so the channel is about reaching customers with the right resources, with the right support, through the right intermediaries, resellers, or service providers, in order to facilitate a sale and foster that relationship. Uh, and channels, indirect sales does this, you know, in a way that is really more cost effective um, than anyone can do direct. You know, and it, it, people say, well, does, doesn't selling direct, isn't it less expensive? Not necessarily. Uh, but if you think about it, um, selling through the channel is a means of doing more with less. So instead of having one-to-one -one relationships with the market, you have one-to-one to -one many. And that's the amplification power of the channel. That's brilliant. I appreciate that. Thank you for giving us the basis on that side. So the first issue of Channelnomics quarterly business just came out, and it was discussing the X chasm. Can you mm -hmm. give myself and the audience a little bit of insight on what that is? What is the X-chasm, and why should we be concerned about it? Well, there's a, you know, a transformation wave that, you know, it's not even a wave. It's a series of waves. We've been talking about digital transformation and channel transformations for a long time. But the, the market has definitively shifted to a services footing. Uh, and what that means for companies that are selling through the channel, it means that you're more than likely than not to try to sell on a subscription or a term contract that results in recurring payments. From a, from a sell side, that we call that recurring revenue. From a, from a buy side, that looks more, as I said, more like subscriptions. Um, it's more advantageous to sell this way uh, than traditional transactional product sales because Recurring revenue is more predictable, it's more stable, um, and unlike term products sales where or transactional product sales where you buy something and you can make it last for a long time, uh, you have to keep paying. So it's more advantageous for the seller to sell that way. The X chasm, though, is for those legacy companies that grew up on selling transactionally. And what it describes is these intersecting lines, one going up, one going down. 
Uh, the downs is the transform is what happens to the legacy model is should trend down as your new services based model or subscription based model trends up. And at the inflection point is where both trend lines accelerate. And the trap, the chasm is getting over that line. Because what a lot of companies want to believe is that they can grow this recurring revenue while at the same time keeping their legacy revenue stable or steady or in some cases even up, you know, trending up. And we have yet to see that happen. And so when we're in counseling companies on how to make this transformation, we have to tell them is that you have to get over the exchasm. You have to accept that there is going to be revenue that's going to go away. It's going to be replaced by the services revenue first. It'll be replacement revenue. Then second, it will be incremental growth revenue. And this might be um, hearkening into the same thing, but when I heard you speak recently, you mentioned a book by the author Jeffrey Moore that was called Crossing the Chasm, which speaks mm -hmm. about marketing and selling high-tech products to mainstream customers. And while that was initially published back in 1991, why is that so important in the XR industry that we're living in today? It, it, you know, If you think about XR, it's not a... It's a wonderful technology, but its true application is based in use cases, and those use cases are derivative of specific industries. How construction and engineering uses XR is different than how it will be used in healthcare, different than how it will be used um, in, in uh, I'm trying to think of another use case, uh, services industries, right? So right. there's, or even entertainment, the use cases are all different, right? So... The reason why crossing the chasm, I think, is so relevant, the reason why I brought it up in the, the, the event that I was speaking at on this subject is because companies that are in XR have to understand that they are selling into niches of the market. They are not selling into an XR market. They are selling into a niche within the XR market, which is also a community of buyers. And these buyers of what Jeffrey Moore was brilliantly described in this book is not just the, the, the phases of early adopters to late adopters and, and getting over the hump of that, that market, that market share development, which again, where the, the chasm starts, there's a certain point in his model in which companies fall off because they're not able to get over the gap. But Moore also describes how buyers, all, you know, group together. And if you're able to sell into a community, those buyers will talk to each other and they too will influence each other's purchasing decision making, which then accelerates adoption. And that's the entire point and reason why that book is so important. It's so important to everybody. I, I don't think that it is unimportant to anyone in any, any business. I mean, he describes it very well, but it applies especially well to technology and has immediate applications to XR. And with that being said, so you've got tons of knowledge when it comes to uh, the channel and how to navigate. So just from your perspective, and this is a pretty broad question, but I always like to ask these type of questions just to get feedback from different people inside the industry. What are you seeing as a disruptive innovator in the industry right now? Well, it depends on what you define as disruptive or what is innovation. Uh, you know, I... Mm. Some people would say I'm a bit of a curmudgeon when it comes to stuff like this because I look at I look at when people say innovation, I see incremental changes or you know building on top of things that have already happened. Um, there's if you think about it, just to give you a kind of a gross example of what I'm what I'm talking about is we're talking about the EV revolution with electric vehicles, right? This isn't new. We had electric cars a hundred years ago. You know, it's not, and even a car is not really an innovation. Yes, it's a different mode of powering transportation, but it's a, essentially the same mode of transportation we had with horse and buggy. So we're building off of lessons that we've that we've acquired over time. Um, what's disruptive today? I, I don't find anything particularly disruptive as much as it is creating new opportunities. Um, there's two trends that I'm following very closely. One is the shift in macroeconomics from quantitative to qualitative um, economic trends, which means is that we're going into what the economists are predicting 
or forecasting is that we've already entered a protracted period of low growth. Um, right. So rather than seeing a relatively high rate of growth um, that we've seen over the last 10, 20 years in technology, we're going to see, you're still going to see growth, but it's going to be at a lower rate because there isn't a new industry, a new transformative technology or anything that's going to come to market that's going to just hockey stick growth us. Um, so that's one trend. But the other trend is, is that digital transformation. And digital transformation is taking analog processes and mechanisms and applying digital alternatives or digital equivalents to it to create better speed, better agility, um, more optimized outcomes. And the reason why I watch those these two trends in tandem is because if we are going into a low growth mode, which means is that businesses are going to have to, uh, by definition, they're going to have to start doing more with less. They're going to have to optimize their operations in order to maximize their re maximize their they, um, their revenue, minimize their expenses, and get more out of their systems. And in doing so, they're going to have to turn to digital alternatives to get more out of technology to help power their businesses in this low growth era. Yeah, that's super interesting. Um, one of the questions I want to ask you after after hearing you talk, which, by the way, fantastic public speaker, if anyone doesn't have a, an opportunity and you're looking for someone who's going to help you grow uh, direct or indirect partner or channel sales, please book Larry. He, he's a wealth of knowledge, obviously. Um, but I was well, listening to your uh, changing channels. Go ahead. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to well, no, no, no. I just want to tell you, I just, you know, so if anybody does want to have me speak, I'm, I, I do it all the time, but there's a trick to being a good public speaker is not knowing what you're going to say. I like that. <laughs> it really does make things a bit more authentic. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, I usually go into a presentation like the one you saw with a game plan, but not actual remarks. So it's it's always interesting. I never even know what I'm going to say when I walk out on stage. You know, it's kind of funny because I handle the podcast kind of the same way. Uh, I purposefully mm. will not write questions for a podcast until the day of because mm. I don't want to know things at such a micro or like a macro level. I want to have a 50,000 foot view. Right. And I don't want to get so deep into the conversation to where I already know what you're going to say. I'd rather have poignant questions that are based on things that are going to be related to your expertise. But I don't want to get so far into the weeds that I feel like I'm already pre-scripted or anything like that. So I completely can understand how that is the best way to go. It also keeps you nimble, realistically. Well, that, like you have to, uh, I learned a lesson. So as you mentioned in your intro, I used to be a journalist. I started my career as a newspaper reporter. Um, and when I was in college, I was being mentored by a guy by the name of David Nine, who was a columnist for the Boston Globe. Um, and we were at an event in Boston and it was David Nine and Mark Shields, uh, who was a longtime personality on uh, PBS. Um, he recently passed a couple months ago. But Mark Shields turned to me, I, and they're going to do this panel at this event. And, he, and I said, so what are you guys going to be talking about? And he looks at me and goes, I'm gonna have, I have three things I'm going to say. You know, So watch for me. I'm going to say these three things. I go, how do you know you're going to say th these three things? He goes, I don't care what they ask me. These are the three things I'm going to say. And so that lesson you take away from that, and I'd say this to everyone, go into any situation, always have three things in your pocket that you can always pull out. I think that's brilliant advice. I'll actually use that going forward myself on the podcast just because it's a good way to go. You, ha yeah. you don't want to be too scripted. You, you want to come off as authentic. And at the exact same time, you do want to seem knowledgeable at the exact same time. But yeah. uh being scripted comes off as fake, and it's easily seen. So, and I thought that you were fantastic in how you spoke, and that makes a lot of sense now that you're like, nope, just going to worry about these three things. Everything else is just in the ether, and we'll go from there. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Yeah, no, no, no. One of the things I wanted to ask you, I, I went and looked at your Changing Channels video podcast, and mm -hmm. you mentioned that the average vendor generates 95% of their revenue from 5% of their partners. And with so many companies that are out there wanting to make that connection for the perfect partner to help turn the tides in sales, why is that sort of a misnomer in the industry realistically? <sighs> What do you mean? Is in terms of how little revenue well, flow, uh, how much revenue flow, flows through f how few partners? 
Yeah, I think everyone is, uh, everyone in the industry is looking for, you know, hey, we're looking to partner with that right partner who's going to really help us make our, our thing go from zero to 60 that quickly. And that's not necessarily how that always works. A lot of the times there is only one partner who helps get you there, but it's building those relationships along the way that's going to help you really find that increase in overall revenue. Yeah. I you think know, you mentioned it's kind of like the long tail of channel. Well, I mean, I, well, I think so. There's a couple of things to to hash out here. One is there is the, the numbers you're citing are correct. Is that five percent of of companies partners will generate ninety five percent of the revenue, more or less. Uh, everybody tends to gravitate around Pareto, who better known for the eighty twenty rule. Um, it, rarely do we see it actually work out that way. Is it's, it's the, the top partners are a distinct minority. In fact, we've seen a company that um, most of their revenue, and, I mean, this is a company that had, literally has a couple hundred thousand partners around the world. Um, most of their revenue is flowing through 50 partners. Uh, I mean, it's, it comes down to that little. Now, if we had the opportunity to work with only the right partners, the ones that are going to be dedicated, they're going to be fully engaged, they're going to get themselves trained up, they're going to be innovative in being able to, you know, not only sell your products, but able to enhance the value of it with their own offerings. Um, that would be great. At the same time, you know, I wish my Red Sox would field nine ace players every year and they would be in the playoffs. <laughs> right. Um, rather than in the, uh, Rather than then finish in the season in the basement of the ALEs. It just doesn't work that way. You know, not every kid in school is going to be an A student. Not every student is going to be a valedictorian. Not every car coming off the line is going to be perfect. And, you know, there, there's, you go down the, you know, just think about daily life. Nothing is always, there's not everything is, can be superior by, you know, by definition. There is gradations in terms of quality performance. Um, as well as in expectations. And so that's the reason why that 95 5 uh, ratio is out there. Now, I've, like I said, I've seen it lower than I've seen 95, 90% of revenue being generated by 2% of partners. Um, it's just the nature of it. Now, the vendors also have a role in that, um, in that they also tend to, or particularly, channel account managers tend to gravitate to the partners that either make the most noise or generate the most results. So if there's a partner out there that they're working with that is really killing it, they're going to keep going to that same partner over and over and they will, and, and then they'll therefore neglect another partner that may want to try to break through, but that they just can't get attention. So there's, it's not a singular uh, source of, 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 conflict here there's not a single point that just that, that makes this happen this is just the realities of doing business 100 percent, and i can uh 100 also relate to your red Sox uh shame with my texas rangers we spent half a billion dollars in the offseason still couldn't make the playoffs couldn't even get out of the basement of the division it just is what it is but you guys have the yankees to deal with every year yeah, that's true. Fun fact, though, is that if anybody's heard of a company called Akamai, they're big in the security space. They're, uh, oh, damn it, he's not at Akamai anymore. He's now at, uh, I'm going to screw this up. <sighs> I'm trying to think. He was at Akamai, and now he's at, um, I can't remember the name, but Michael McCullough. He was a, he's a global channel chief at um, Imperva. Sorry, oh, God, I hate it when I do that. Sorry, it's just a bit of a brain fart there. Uh, Global Channel Chief at Imperva also played for the Texas um, Texas Rangers. Oh, that's pretty interesting. That's awesome. Yeah, the former ball player. <laughs> really good guy, too. Really good guy. What's funny is most of those guys who used to play ball and they end up being in the tech sector, I've met a handful of them over the time that I've been doing emerging tech in my last 20 years. They're all good guys for whatever reason. They're just happy to be there, usually love telling their anecdotes and stories from their time in the MLB. and They're always a good conversation to have, especially after a conference. Yeah. No, it's it, like you get to meet a lot of interesting people in this business, some that actually come over into, in, into working the business and then more often, particularly at the – at the live events is that uh, 
the vendors and the vendor organizers, they always want to gravitate towards some retired, you know, retired player who's, you know, making a living doing photographs and autographs and, you know, does the same canned speech uh, at every event they go to. But, you know, it's like you get to walk up to somebody like, um, you know, Joe Montana, which I did at one event, and just like going, oh, well, I'm getting my picture taken with Joe Montana. This is kind of cool. And then you get Absolutely. to go home and explain to the kids, well, who Joe, who's Joe Montana? Oh, never mind. It's <laughs> right. It's so funny how the younger generation has no, but you know, our generation didn't have an acceptance of the ones that were in the fifties and sixties and ones that laid the groundwork for the modern players of the 70s, 80s, nineties and the aughts for our generation as well. And I think that's just going to be a consistent basis. No matter what, uh, younger generations will never appreciate who those players were, regardless of the sport or what they did for the sport. The exception, of course, being Tom Brady. Because, Tom Brady will be a universal person, yeah. Go. Yeah, because you know, he, I grew up watching him. I mean, since the you know, since two thousand and one, watching Tom Brady, and I have a niece, sixteen year old niece, who knew nothing but Tom Brady for her entire fandom of uh, football. So I mean, it's, yeah, it's like going to, the, the, he is the exception. He is the exception to the rule. He will go down probably as the greatest sportsman of all time, in my opinion. Yep. And I hate him for it, but I, at the same time, I just appreciate how great he is. It is what yep. it is, you know? Yep, I hate that he doesn't wear a Patriots uniform anymore. Oh, I bet. I bet. Yep. Mac Jones so. is uh, having a little bit of fun, but it'll be all right. Yeah. So pulling us back over here, for a company, Larry, that wants to move into the channel that maybe just hasn't had any channel experience before, are there any basis or basics that you would recommend to companies that don't have any experience previously, but they do see that as a path to long-term success for them? Uh, okay, first, you call me, and that is always right. a great starting point. <laughs> I agree. I agree. Um, we, we counsel even companies that have been in the channel to start at the same place. You know, because this is what we get. We get companies that want to develop channels. We have companies that want to reform their existing channels. We have companies that want to replace their existing channels. That's that's who we serve. That's what Channelomics does. Um, we always start at the same point by defining what the channel imperative is. Now, even though that the channel does exist, it doesn't mean that it is necessarily something that you can or should be working with. There is there's no sin in selling direct if that's the best way of going to market. Um, two essential questions. We have a series of litmus tests we go through to define the, the, the channel imperative. But there's two questions we ask everyone, which is what can partners do that you can't do? And what can partners do that you don't want to do? And if you can answer affirmatively to either one of those questions that there is a there is something that they can partners can or can do or something that they can do that you don't want to do, um, and it can't be money, it can't be oh they have customers so therefore we can get sales. It can't that can't be the answer because it's too easy. Whatever those tasks, whatever those functions are that are listed as an answer to those two questions, money can be the derivative, the product of those activities, but it can't be the primary focus. So if you can define what the, if you can answer those two questions, then we can pretty much define what the imperative is, the reason for the channel to exist, and then find the value proposition for the partner and ultimately the customer. And that's good. That's right there is the starting point for everything that we do. That makes sense. And I like that it's simplified. Hey, here's the two main things that we really need to go into. And then you don't get too far in the weeds in it. And then it also makes them do some strategic thinking. Um, e even though some folks may have things that they don't want to do, they have to decide if they're going to offload them. And that, that's a good thought provoking way of making them come to a realization on their own terms. So I wanted to go a little sideways on you, but I heard you speak on this previously, and I just thought it was really poignant. So with the, the change of the world that we've seen since the pandemic, building personal and business relationships have changed, but not necessarily in the bad way. We've all been to a conference, and we've returned with a fistful of business cards without the ability to put a name to the face that are listed on the card. But since the pandemic, what have you seen as successful ways that companies are building those types of relationships now? It's a big question. I'm going to start off by by saying that I I am not an advocate for racing back to the road. Um, I typically pre pandemic I would fly somewhere between 150 and 200 thousand miles a year. 
Um, and brutal. Uh, and it was. It was uh, look great airline miles and status, but you know, I bet. you know, uh, you know, one of the things I learned during the pandemic is that uh, food doesn't net magically appear in my house, and that the people walking around they're actually my family. Um, so it's like it, I was like I had no idea. I, I spent two years at home and I reconnected with people. I'm like, oh, I, I actually kind of like these people. Right. <laughs> um, two main people within the business treat business travel uh, as a part of their lifestyle, not as an imperative. And I think that that's one of the things that still hasn't leveled off. Now, we're going through this sort of a slingshot effect, this, this rebound effect. Is that okay? We sprung forward. And now we're, you know, we'll, oh, I believe it will happen is we'll start pulling back a little bit. Some of it will be economic on uh, necessity, but we now have more options available to us. You know, the old saying is, you know, the friend of mine had this T-shirt. If you, you know, it was, or many people had it, is that, you know, I survived a meeting that could have been an email. Um, now we have the ability to connect with people like we are here in this podcast. We're connecting over you know, this virtualized medium. Um, and we're having a quite effective communication. I have more meetings and I'm more productive using collaboration tools, using video conferencing than I ever was pre pandemic. Um, how are others doing it? Well, they're forming communities. They're doing hangouts. Um, they're using technology to be more human. And it's not to say that it is a complete replacement for in-person meetings or in-person events, but we are able to leverage technology in ways that free us so that we can form better interpersonal relationships. And one of the things that we have found in the research that we do is that nothing drives behavior more and drives it more positively than personal connections. So, that's the reason why I think that if, you know, how are other companies, how are companies doing this? How are they, you know, building and thriving? The ones that can figure out how to make genuine, authentic, personal, personal relationships in business are the ones that win. 100%. And with how everything's been going, especially with now everyone's worried about greenhouse gases and anything that's affecting the, the world's atmosphere, we don't need to rush back to those things. Realistically, all COVID really did for us was expedite the ability for us to utilize the tools that have already been there, but maybe just didn't have the adoption rates that they had before. Well, like you said, we, we can have a conversation this way rather than me getting on a plane, flying out to where you are in New York or wherever you happen to be at at the moment and setting up a meeting, then getting a cab, then driving over to where you're at. And we don't have to do those things anymore. It's, it's a waste of resources and time. I'm going to check. Yep, those are photos of my family. I must be at my office. Okay. Uh, so, <laughs> no, it, it, it's true, though. It, it, it's, it's true. Um, it, we, we can do more this way. But you're going back to one of your first questions. The reason why, you know, we've had all these tools before. So why now? Why did the, you know, the pandemic forced us into a position to where we had to, and then we discovered what we could do, what was possible? That's the exact definition of cross, you know, the X chasm. That's the exact way is that you don't want to change. And oftentimes, um, Peter Drucker, uh, said, I think, said it best, is that uh, culture eats strategy for breakfast. And, I love that quote. And it's... It's true because one of the biggest obstacles to innovation, um, even when we know the innovation or we know that the change is going to result in a positive outcome, the biggest obstacle to making the change is culture. That's not how we do it. We have different priorities. In fact, I, was, I, I openly say this, is, is that the original sin in business is compensation plans. So anything that runs into a comp plan, anything that runs into affecting a P&L will automatically meet resistance. So I have one final question for you, Larry, and I hope you don't mind. It's a little bit of levity because I can't help myself. So I know you're a lifelong Star Trek fan, and yeah. we have seen communicators, telepresence, universal translators, and tablet computers all come to fruition and become a reality over the last couple of years 
And they've been on the show since the 60s, obviously. But what do you believe is going to be the next one to become a reality? Warp drive, tractor beams, or phasers? Well, first, let's just dispense with one thing about transporters. Is that um, So uh, there is a German physicist called Heisenberg who said that you can't tell the difference. Uh, you can tell the speed of, a, of an atom or the direction an atom is traveling, but you can't tell, tell both at the same time because observation will change it. And so that is the thing that actually makes a transporter an impossible thing because in order to actually transport matter, you would need to know the location and the speed of an atom. And so observing it would change it. So how did Star Trek deal with it? They called it the Heisenberg Compensator. And when they asked the writers of Star Trek, um, you know, how does the transporter work? Or how does the Heisenberg compensator work? And their response was, it works very, very well. So, I mean, it's... <laughs> <laughs> but it completely looks past the, the fact that if a transporter existed and it worked the way it does in Star Trek, it is essentially a suicide machine because all it does is that it literally ends your life but recreates a different version of you that happens to know everything that you know. So it's, it's, a, it's one of these great nerdy techno debates that happens within the star trek world what's going to happen next out of star trek i you know i really don't know they've it's been such inspiration um both culturally um as well as from the technology perspective i, I mean I, I really wish that we would just have automatically opening you know pocket doors we don't have that right. anywhere right i mean that would be a great leap for me um or that we would have horizontal elevators uh, because that's what you know the you know these turbo lifts you know essentially they're elevators but if you actually look at it they're actually traveling both vertically and horizontally uh, so it's it's more of a subway system on you know on the enterprise um, what do I think will actually come next probably phasers because yeah. we and we tend to invent weapons more than we do invent other things um, so there's been a, there's there has been uh, people are familiar with it, the, the tricorder, the thing that they carry around to scan everything. They actually do have prototypes of that today. So that is coming. There was a contest to build a working version of a tricorder for medical purposes, and they know they do have it. Um, they're making some really great advances in microfluidics so that they'll actually be able to. So if you've read the book Bad Blood or know about um uh, the, the saga at uh, Elizabeth Holmes and, and Theranos, the, 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 the massive scam over blood testing. Um, microfluidics is actually becoming a thing, and there are companies that are making some really great advances of being able to do broad medical tests based on very small uh, volumes of blood samples. Uh, and these are all things that we see in Star Trek. And I think it's not, I mean, one of the great things about science fiction writers is that they dream of things and they're not just pulling it out of thin air. There's actual, if it's not based in science, which all Star Trek tends to be, um, then it does become inspiration to try to push the boundaries where what could be next. And that's the thing. That's one of the reasons why I just love the franchise. And what's funny, you, you mentioned something about the elevators going back and forth. I never made this comparison in my head before between Star Trek. But um, think about um, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory. Actually, Roald Dahl, uh, it, there's a lot of similarities there, too. He transported a chocolate bar. He had uh, Willy Wonka and the Great Glass Elevator that could also move side to side. And those both came out in the 60s to initiate. So I wonder if one borrowed from the other or, or who really came up with one versus the other. I never really thought about those two things before, but there, they do kind yeah, of correlate. Look, there's only seven original stories in the world, right? So everything is derivative. Everything is you right. know, one of the four you know you know, plot devices of man versus man, man versus himself, man versus nature, you know, so we can always trace it down to something. And there are like source points for basically everything. Um, but I think the thing with science fiction writers is that they, do they borrow from each other? They do. Absolutely. Um, but they're thinking about things in a different level than we do. And if you look at like some of the really great sci-fi writers like Philip K. Dick, I mean, he envisioned a whole different spectrum of the world that, that we could be living in. Um, mercifully, I'm glad we don't, 
but there's some <laughs> great things that happen within the within within his imagination that we live with today. Um, and like I said, the same thing goes to Star Trek. The one thing to be definitely certain of is that Star Trek is inspirational when it comes to technology. Star Wars is inspirational for making toys. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you're going to do the debate, you're absolutely right in that aspect. We can make anything look cute and sell it in a Disney store if we yep, can. Pretty, pretty much. <laughs> well, Larry, I got to tell you, it, it's been great talking to you. Every time I get a chance to hear you speak or speak with you, it's always a pleasure. Um, I hope we covered everything and we're able to show a little bit of light about Channelnomics. Um, anything else that you wanted us to touch on before we wrap up our show today? Uh, no, I mean, look, people, please come check us out. Uh, my podcast is Changing Channels, available YouTube and wherever else they put out podcasts, Spotify, I, I think they tell me that. Um, our magazine, Channel Nomics Quarterly, uh, the fall issue will be coming out uh soon if not already um and you'll probably see me at any number of events because that's where i live so you know, please come talk to me because i just i love having good conversations like this one well and for our audience members uh you can subscribe to that channel nomics quarterly magazine if you go to channel nomics that's c-h-a-n-n-e-l-n-o-m-i-c-s dot com slash cq and then you can also find larry's channel on youtube uh, that's called changing channels if you just search on youtube you'll be able to find that easily and then follow larry on twitter as well you can find his hashtag at lm walsh underscore cn and i wanted to also thank our sponsor kincannon xr for sponsoring our podcast you can find them on social media platforms at kincannon xr and then you can find this podcast on socials as well we're at etib podcast um, that's going to do it for today. Larry, thanks again for the time. Uh, everybody at home, I hope you got some really great knowledge from a, a fantastic writer, speaker. If you ever have a chance to hear Larry speak in per uh, person, understand he's going to tell you three things, which regardless of how he's going to talk to you. Uh, so for everybody at home, Larry, again, thank you for the time. I've been your host, Brock Briney, everybody. We're going to talk some more emerging tech next time. Hope everybody has a great day.